Daily Talk Show and we're still in Los Angeles. And we're at Bluestone Lane Cafe with the mm-hmm. founder, Nicholas Stone. Welcome, boys. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Thanks so much. I mean, priorities. I feel like this, doing a podcast with a couple of gronks, low on the priority <laughs> list, so we appreciate That's you being okay. Here. You know, it, I, I had three other meetings cancelled. <laughs> oh, I you thought, did? All right, you know, three. If it was just one, I wouldn't be here. But it was three. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good. So, no. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks for taking the time. And, uh, you know, we've got some fantastic uh, ambience out here. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, typical LA day, 4,000 cars per minute <laughs> yeah. and, a, and a bobcat demolishing <laughs> demolishing road. So. Yeah, it looks like they're carving out, like, some new uh, lines or, or something like that. Something's going on. Yeah, that uh, or... Um, uh, we've got a very yeah. Melbourne coffee coming our way. What have you oh, got here? What, what, what have you, have you just had planted down? oat milk. Piccolo, actually. I know that's the single oat, shot. The oat, oat milk. milk's very American. Very, very, uh, very California. Yeah. Okay. You know, the non-dairy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very health conscious and uh, aesthetic. Aesthetics over taste, maybe. Uh-huh. A little. Well, <laughs> I tried to um, wean off any milk or uh, even oat milk or almond milk style coffees coming over here I thought I could go back and it's all black mm-hmm. which I wanted to do but then you find places like this Blue Sand Lane it's it's the quality of Melbourne coffee yeah. in the States and so this establishment we're in California you, you started out in NYC yes uh I think Josh I kept spent the business a lot, afloat well, with his I spent girlfriend. a lot of time. So I think it was like 2013 or 2014. My girlfriend had this list of places that we had to go. And by the end of it, we I reckon we, we went to more Australian cafes or like the amount of time we spent at Bluestone Lane... It felt like I was in Mel- Melbourne the whole the whole time. Is that a common thing? How many Aussies do you reckon come through the door versus Americans? It's, it would definitely be... Yeah. Sizable and locations like West Hollywood yeah. and West Village in mm-hmm. New York City, without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, in our more business-centric locations, mm-hmm. not many tourists. Yeah, tourists yeah. are sort of wandering up there. But when you're in residential areas or where yeah. people want to hang out and spend time on holiday, like we're on the we're on the path of, of, yeah. of travel, and it's we're so fortunate to have so many Australians come to the states and. Mm-hmm look out for Bluestone Lane and want to go to Bluestone Lane and they're quite parochial and passionate about our coffee culture and we've been such beneficiaries of it because Mm. if the Australians that have lived in the States and Australian tourists have acted as this tastemaker they've been these organic influencers that have introduced that proposition Mm. and told their American friends hey you know you should have something slightly better Why, why spend five bucks or four bucks on a coffee at Starbucks when you can have spend the same amount but get the Bluestone Lane experience and uh, we, we've been, we've got, the, we got the timing right from that perspective. Mm-hmm. The, the year which we opened our first store was in 2013. The dollar was particularly strong, yeah. and I think five percent of all Australians visited the US that year. Yeah. Over one million Australians visited the US. Just, just we were saying 2012. 2012 year. was a great year because yeah, every parody. in, in t- yeah 2012 it felt like Tommy was do- having the trip of his life. It was oh, yeah. uh, pre-marriage and all that sort of thing, getting yeah, very far. Uh, <laughs> Very far from that. <laughs> but um, why, why the US? Why did you uh, decide to set up shop here? Well, I I'm, I'm always wanted to live in the States, and mm-hmm. I wanted to live in New York in particular. And I, was, I went from football, playing AFL for six years. Luckily, I went to university at the same time because I only played for six years and so not too many games. Um, and then I went into uh, you know, corporate finance, investment banking, and I met this beautiful woman at Derby Day, which is... Uh, Obviously, one of the, the major courtship festivals on <laughs> yeah. the Australian calendar, Derby Day. And uh, and basically, I had this dream of going overseas and I sort of was trying to convince her that it'd be a great idea to go and live and work in New York City. Mm. And she went along with the idea and she was studying at university as well, but thought, you know, it'd be, it'd be quite good. She was actually modelling like on the side and as a part-time job, but, but she was very focused on her degree, which was... She's studying osteopathic medicine, so she's, <laughs> she's got a bigger brain than me. But, yeah, um, yeah. And then, long story short, I tried to get transferred and uh, I wasn't able to, to, to get land a job because of the financial crisis. Mm. But at that point in time, I'd already completed a, a postgraduate degree in Master of Finance. And I was trying to work out ways in which I could get to the States. And one of them was about you know, studying over here and doing an MBA or doing an exchange. And I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to study in New York City and... 
Welcome. Nice welcome. Welcome. welcome to LA. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's a lovely Thursday afternoon. And, uh, you know, that acted as a catalyst also to provide a job opportunity. Mm. And so I ended up moving in 2010, started studying in September 2010. Mm. And when I got here, I just couldn't believe how different the coffee culture was. Yeah. And I also mm. just didn't have an appreciation of how successful Starbucks is. And yeah. I think, like, everyone... Particularly Australians, like quite a myopic, you know, insular view. The Starbucks is, you yeah. know, the Antichrist and terrible mm-hmm. and, you know, inferior. But the business model itself and the brand they're built is absolutely extraordinary. Mm-hmm. In such a small point of time, you know, period of time, building a $120 billion US yeah. brand, uh, $23 billion of revenue a year in 40 <laughs> years, yeah. and introducing espresso coffee to the States. And I just thought there's got to be an opportunity to, to, be, to be more authentically Australian, to have a better quality product, better quality service, better quality aesthetic and really make people feel like they're going to their local establishment and that that was basically the catalyst, the mm. business opportunity, the market opportunity. I was a, I would be a core cool customer and but I'd never worked a day in hospitality. So that's what's the most un, unique thing I think about Bluestone is like the founder and CEO of probably the largest hospitality Australian export yeah. now. Um, <laughs> Never worked today You'd in hospitality. Be horrendous at undercover boss. You'd just be <laughs> dropping the coffees. Oh, did you? So bad. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, how do you how do you turn on the coffee machine? Is it um, a? Um, do you think it's an advantage because you you don't have you're not jaded as someone who uh, has experienced the annoyance of maybe you know dealing with customers or being on that front line to come in and go, oh, look, I see an opportunity. Yeah, I do. I, you're completely unbridled, unencumbered from any preconceived notion of like you got to do it this way and the steps of service and this mm-hmm. is how you treat someone and you, you can't price it that way it's it i think you can you can trial things thanks brandon <laughs> lunch are up um i think you can try things without fear and i think you probably apply this lesson to so many things in life mm. and i guess you know everyone a lot of people get caught up in this notion of like they're you know they're an entrepreneur and you know, they're doing a, they're creating a startup. Like really, Bluestone's a small, a, a fast-growing small business, mm-hmm. and that's the underbelly of all economies globally. And I think with, with me, I just looked at the way in which I could sort of keep iterating and learn, and and with a real discreet focus on building a brand. And and me being, uh, and then my wife in particular being core customers, and like, mm-hmm. what would we want if we walked in and. And we had fantastic examples being connoisseurs living in Melbourne that we felt like we could replicate that here. And so when you moved to, uh, to the US, what was your previous experience? How long had you spent in the US prior to actually moving here? So I moved September 2010, uh, studied until the end of the year mm-hmm. and then started uh, at ANZ in their corporate finance team in February and I was really tasked with rebuilding the team in New York and London mm-hmm. uh, because there was obviously a view that that the world and the financial markets were, were destined mm. to be obliterated and that was sort of happening in the US and Europe but Australia was relatively immune mm. and we had some catalysts that predated the GFC that meant that the regulatory sort of authorities were more stringent and we didn't have this massive problem with with debt serviceability at the mm-hmm. household level. So suddenly it went from risk off to risk on. And mm-hmm. like, oh, now if you can build a business, we could actually go for market share here and we could mm-hmm. grow in Asia. And we had a new CEO who was very, very um, excited about the opportunity. So I worked, so I started then and I didn't do anything for a couple of years, even though I'd worked on the business case at, at business school in New York. But then it was till July, 2013, we opened our first store in Midtown Manhattan, very close to where our office was, mm-hmm. which was on, uh, between 47th and 48th on, mm. on on Park and then went from one store to two stores and went to three stores and four stores and they all kept working and <laughs> I didn't really have any harbour any ambitions of ever going full time Yeah. and then I went full time finally in mid 2016 at 12 stores three years later we're you know, nearly 50 stores so. what is it what is an investment banker actually do i guess we have this uh, tommy Invest imagine in banks <laughs> yeah i mean what, yeah what is an actual day to day i can assume that it's like uh, you click a few buttons are and you then down you wall do street are you, are you like near the bull cocaine for lunch and then you come back like what is the what is the reality of, that was definitely the, the yeah. heydays of the 80s you know <laughs> okay. I, I, we, we missed that period I, we got the austerity measures yeah. and like bankers are overpaid uh-huh. and oh listen i think 
if you're interested in companies, mm -hmm. it's an amazing job because your basic role is to understand how a company creates value and how it grows and what the capital it needs to be able to make investments. Mm -hmm. And your role is to mm -hmm. sort of support that, whether providing them capital or advising on how they spend it. And you know, it's fascinating that you get to work with so many different people and, and brands and companies. And I love that. I was mm -hmm. so intrigued about like, how does, you know, if you look, let's just take it in, let's take Amazon like mm -hmm. Amazon's story absolutely remarkable yeah. you know to lose money for 10 years in a row and then suddenly 10 years later be the biggest company in the world like mm. those sort of examples fascinated me and um, I love the competitive nature of it too I think mm -hmm. that, like going after market share and how do you compete mm. against your competitors and your value proposition and I was always intrigued by it and uh, that's how I sort of fell into my love of business and banking. So and you have a portfolio or something? Is it no, like we, okay I had I was I had basically in the States I had customers that I'd work on and provide ideas mm -hmm. on how yeah. they could create more value. So it was pretty broad. It was mm -hmm. anything from how to enter the Asia Pacific market, how to reduce their cost of capital or like how much interest they're paying on all their capital mm -hmm. could be how to optimize their capital structure or you know like how to fund their supplies or how mm. to fund their so you're working yeah. with like cfos or yeah, something yeah treasurers cfos yeah, yeah that's that's and so that was a, so if it's anz does that mean that it's australian businesses wanting to enter into north america or it was primarily american businesses mm -hmm. that wanted to grow in asia pacific okay. and australia oh, well anz was really making a hard push concerted mm -hmm. push in asia pac mm -hmm. now that's changed a bit with the the, the Royal Commission and, and honestly like the, the banks make more money in Australia than mm -hmm. any other region in the world like the mm -hmm. return on equity is so high um, because the defaults are so low because of that you know the full accountability on your home loan and recourse like people yeah. don't really walk away from homes and cars like they do here mm -hmm. you know um, so the defaults are so much lower and it's just a lot more concentrated down there so, yeah, it was primarily U.S. corporates growing mm -hmm. in the Asia-Pac region. But, yes, yeah, certainly there were some Australian brands mm -hmm. that were trying to land in the U.S., but they're just typically so much smaller. Like the mm -hmm. big Aussies, that had, you know, the biggest, like, let's just say the top 100 ASX, like mm -hmm. very few uh, have meaningful market share in the U.S. Like mm -hmm. some obviously are in resources, but that's not really a U.S. story. Mm -hmm. The banks, they're not really in the U.S., um, yeah, you know, we're still a very Australian domestic focused and Asia Pacific focused sort of economy. Mm -hmm. I, I look around, there's so much construction going on and we were in New York last year and I think, I look around, so much is happening and I think, how, how do you even start something over there, especially as someone who isn't from America? Where do you start? How much capital do you need to create a cafe in New York City? It's, it's certainly not cheap. Uh, you, and New York is is just the, the epicenter of the world. It's truly the world's city, eight million people a day, yeah. and it's the biggest influence on commerce, arts, fashion. Uh, it's it's incredibly incredibly inspiring and electric place. Mm -hmm. But the, the risk you've got is rent is so expensive there that you get the wrong real estate, mm -hmm. you you're cooked. Yeah, you, know, yeah. you could be over in a matter of couple of months what would um, like a corner like what it, how much would a lease cost and, it, and is it oh, the same structure as in Australia or no so the handy thing in New York is because defaults are so high that the actual recourse structure is a lot lower than uh -huh. Australia so if you sign a lease in Australia you could be on the hook for 10 years mm -hmm. in New York you could be on the hook for 6 months or 12 yeah, months sure. so that's more favourable but your probability of failing is so much higher I think <laughs> yeah. um, so it's a risk reward play and as it relates to um, lease, leasing costs, uh, it, to get a great corner in Midtown, it mm -hmm. could cost you around four hundred dollars a square foot, which mm -hmm. is like four thousand dollars a square meter. Okay. Is that and per month? So, or, yeah, so what, and, what's and that, that breakdown? And so that's, yearly, that's annually. So, so let's so, just say we have a site that is a thousand square feet mm -hmm. which is a hundred square meters uh -huh. and it's costing us four hundred dollars mm -hmm. a square foot you're gonna have, have to help us with the maths you're the bank it's, guy it's four hundred thousand yeah. dollars a year yeah, which geez. is which is about like thirty seven thousand dollars a month so how the fuck month. do you do it with coffee how, how does how do you sell coffee Mates. and then make and like yeah. how does it actually work yeah this is the bit i sort of got <laughs> wrong on a few cases <laughs> like yeah We'll do it. We can make it. And then yeah. I back solve it out. Like, you know, coffee, $4 flat white, multiplied yeah. by how many people? Oh, yeah. Oh, 
Wow, I need to sell like 4,000 copies a day. Okay, 4,000 copies divided by 10 hours. Holy smokes, that's 400 copies an hour. Like, how, like okay, how long does a coffee make? Or oh, three minutes? Uh-oh, I can do 20 in an hour. Oh, like, how do I get to four? I can eat 10 espresso machines. And like, so what do you do? So where is the money in so, cafes? So yeah, it's a, it's a very, very, very delicate um, balance between mm -hmm managing your, your lease costs and, and driving enough productivity through your staff. It's certainly not easy. You've got mm -hmm. to get the right rent deal. It takes a long time to get those deals. The landlord's got to trust your brand, got to trust your value proposition and who you are. And, uh, you know, for us, obviously food was a larger part of it, but mm -hmm. like with more food means more people. So. It's, it's not easy, yeah. but you need, you, in our case, we won't sign a deal where the landlord doesn't really want us over anyone else. They have yeah. to feel so fired up and motivated that we're going to be an amenity to, to their building where they're happy to take a bit of a hit or subsidize the retail rent because they're getting their core rent roll or your core revenue from the office tenants above or the mm. mixed use campus like that's how we've we've been able to do it and a lot of the big guys the incumbents like starbucks they've been in there through grandfathered leases which which really you know they probably signed 10 years ago that mm. is um, that cheaper rent yeah certainly because period. rent goes up like rent's basically indexed it goes up three percent a year typically so over 10 years you're yeah. talking 30 percent increase mm. right and some and when they reset rates rent's they often reset them higher to, mm -hmm. you know and so you could be paying 30 40 percent higher than what they were 10 years ago now mm. that's going from 200 dollars a square foot to 370 now that's mm. a big big difference yeah, yeah. i look at uh, we were at ihop last night classic oh uh, yeah i know it was a <laughs> great, the best. great experience but I've it, never been to IHOP. Really? Do you have uh, the pancakes? Or yeah, yeah, we are. I had pancakes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. They 97. Like pancake parlor? Uh, uh, cornea. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it was... I mean, the pancakes, they're fine. But it's... I, I was... We are in this... On Santa Monica Boulevard. It's an old building. It's a bit run down. And I was thinking... There wasn't many people in there. And I was thinking, how are these guys surviving? When you look at businesses that are franchised... Is there some game that's happening where they're spreading the costs across a whole bunch of them and that's how they're even able to have ones that are not doing that well? Yeah, uh, scale. Scale gives you a portfolio approach <laughs> and ultimately brands like IHOP make all their money in suburban markets and and markets that the cost pressures are a lot lighter, you know, mm. they don't have, they've got a lot lower minimum wage, they have significantly lower rents. Mm. The food, the food input costs could be very close to what it is in LA. Like getting food product in here is not easy mm. with the density. It's not easy in New York, but a lot easier out in the suburbs. Um, and honestly, like labor could be 50% the cost it is here and rent could be 30% the cost it is mm. in the middle of LA or middle of New York City. So once you've got enough scale, you've got units that some do 5% margin, some do 30% margin, some do 7%, some do 27%. Mm -hmm blends out at around anywhere from 15 to 22 percent profit margin because they can make more money in in certain markets than they can in the city centers but the city center gives you the incredible brand awareness and and the the momentum to be able to franchise and grow in other markets you know i saw you give me a keynote and um you mentioned that next year 2020 you wanted to have 200 stores 200 cafes but in the same token you in the same keynote you said uh, Starbucks has 15,000 which is in perspective it's mm. a small number what you were saying what's the what's the the thought on going to a number like 200 how does that how are you feeling from you know the first to 50 well it's interesting because I think we have obviously naturally a very australian centric lens with how we look at hospitality and we're pretty much anti-chains and certainly mm -hmm. as it relates to coffee like i think you know, the way that you're talking about coffee oh, i like, came to america and yeah. i was going to drink back coffee and then yeah. i found a bluestone lane yeah. and other australian cafes like yeah. they're independent offer independent owned and operated mm -hmm. very high standard the owner knows everyone really cares about the product and australia's 25 million people the us is 320 million people mm -hmm. yeah. so if you have 
four cafes in Melbourne, which a lot of proprietors do, they're just under different names. You can multiply that by, what, 15 times or something? Mm, yeah. So four by 15, then, you know, it's a lot, that's a 60 cafes, right? Mm. So I think with us, like 200 is very, very achievable because the market's so big, the white space is so great, the independent operators aren't here, and I look at Starbucks and I look at just how many. Oh, this is a tri- trivia question for you. How <laughs> well, many, how many, yeah, how many stores that, but, yeah. okay. in New York City, New York City, okay. does Starbucks have? Oh, uh, there's one on every other street corner. That's I reckon, not the correct answer. No, <laughs> I reckon I'm just doing the maths. Uh, I reckon 200. I was going to say 200, but now I can't. So I'll say uh, 280. 280. 200. Good. 240. Oh, that's quite Halfway. good. We did quite well, didn't we? So it's price is right. <laughs> <laughs> it wins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, lower. I went lower, so that's yeah, better. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll give you 50% win? off a flat white today. <laughs> <laughs> Plus tip. No, 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 I won't actually do that. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> or tax, no discount on that either. Um, you know, so, and I look at New York City and Starbucks and 240, like, you know, it feels sort of without, you know, back of the envelope, it mm. feels like 200 is very achievable um, across, say, 10 cities. Um, the markets we're in now, we're in, we're in seven markets, if you cluster New Jersey and New York Metro together. And, you know, I feel like that's very achievable over the next three to five years. Mm-hmm. I think that next year we're actually going to slow our rate of opening down because we want to have a year where we consolidate the markets we're in. We're not going to go to any new markets, we're going to get deeper and, and I think we just want to make sure we're perfecting everything we're doing as it relates to systems and our team and training and the, and the economics to then rapidly be able to accelerate in 2021 and whether that's under a company owned and a franchise construct or just company owned. But I think like next year's that year where we, we slow a little bit, get everything right to, to go fast again. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I don't know when, if I set it 200 by next year, but like that's certainly <laughs> not possible and uh, not, the, not the ambition. But 200, I think, is very, very comfortable for us mm-hmm. over the next you know, five years, I would say. Yeah, I yeah. feel like coming to the US, there's something a bit scary, a bit like there's a few things that scare me seeing all the billboards with the lawyers and then seeing the ads where it's like everything from you know have you been injured at work to like every spectrum it seems like every second ad is a lawyer saying you know call call us now so there's there's that element then you've got like everything cause you cancer by the set like there's signs everywhere saying this can cause you cancer do you get the sense or the feeling in the US of that anxiety or does it sort of not enter your system it's it's an extremely litigious uh-huh. culture. Like there's, I think there's, everyone talks about there's, there's more lawyers than nurses and, yeah. and doctors combined. And yeah, it's it is it's definitely a major risk with mm-hmm. operating in this market. Um, often, you you may not do anything right. Uh-huh. Uh, no, sorry, you may not do anything wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that Freudian slip. But uh, <laughs> but Just everyone has the floor. everyone has the right to to sue in a, in a very sort of open way and a flexible way because costs aren't awarded. Uh-huh. So for example, you trip over here and you say, Nick, Nick, trip me, it's hurt my leg. I'm gonna sue you because I can't go to work. I'll have to, I'll have to defend myself, but if the court says, you're right, Nick, you did nothing wrong, I can't counterclaim costs uh, yeah. against you. So the motivation to sue is yeah. is infinite, and that's very strange in Australia. That doesn't exist, mm-hmm. right? You know, you, fo- fo- you sue someone under false pretenses, you mm-hmm. lose, you pay the other person's lawyer, yeah. by legal fees. In the US, that's not the case. Mm. So that's why the notion of an ambulance chaser uh-huh. is right, mm. and uh, you know that that's definitely one of the challenges in the market. You need to be really, really careful. You need to be. What does that do to compliance? Like within oh, it's a huge. business, the compliance costs are massive, uh-huh. absolutely massive. The amount of money you'll spend on on uh, HR, people centric, and and uh, lawyers is huge. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a it's a it's a cost of doing business here and a, and a very major one. Um, and I guess there's been a lot of discussion around trying to reduce some of the regulations in certain pockets that could make sense and mm-hmm. others like 
the EPA I do uh -huh. vehemently do not agree with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know there are a lot of costs in, in doing business, uh, and I guess the concern a lot of entrepreneurs or small business owners have is that inflection point where suddenly it becomes cost prohibitive or it, there's not sufficient motivation or incentive to take the risk to be a small to put your own money in to put mm. your reputation on the line to build build business and grow uh, when you know that 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 there's such great this such incredible downside and there's mm. not enough upside um mm. you know like when you start something and you leave a big company like you are taking an incredible amount of risk mm. on yourself on your on your personal life financially it's it's way bigger than i ever thought that was a, mm. that, that was probably the biggest lesson i got from banking you, know, you you think that you're really you know important and you're working with these big companies and it's great <laughs> you're giving it great ideas but it's so intangible yeah. versus okay like go out there and high 10 people and everyone's going to get paid every week and it's dependent on how much money you've got or how much the business makes and like mm. those simple operatorship lessons I think are so valuable and in fact more bankers and more finance professionals and more leaders should actually get exposure to real tangible mm. small economies it'll make them a better a better um, business person without a doubt and I feel that that's been one of the biggest gifts from Bluestone not only working with 700 teammates and making a difference mm. to nearly twelve and a half thousand people a day now but just the lessons around business and uh, how to work in a, in a complicated team from different walks of life different uh, backgrounds has been uh, has been really intrinsically rewarding uh, what, but, but challenging nonetheless what lessons from footy did you learn and that you apply now in business well, team sports in Australia are incredible because they're quite democratised and everyone needs to be pretty cross-functional, right? Every, you know, you play AFL footy, everyone needs to know how to kick, mm -hmm. handball, tackle, mark, play cricket, you know, it's everyone sort of knows how to bat. The US sports are pretty segmented. Like yeah. in baseball, you could just pitch but never bat. You could catch and never be yeah. in the outfield. You can be in the outfield and never pitch. The U. S. You know, look, football offense never on the same side of the field as the defense. Yeah. Never on the field at one time. You may never touch the ball in your entire career. You can make a hundred million dollars and never have actually touched the pigskin. Mm. You're describing and, my uh, footy junior footy career. Yeah, I would <laughs> mind that hundred mil not to touch the ball. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that's incredible how it's such an important part of our upbringing and culture. Yeah. Like you, you learn how to deal with people who have different skill levels and different motivations and different athleticism it's 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 a great equalizer and working together congruently and everyone knowing their role and executing their role underpins how businesses operate right you need everyone to know what they're doing to be focused to execute along those lines and to lean in when others need help and i've tried to really embrace a lot of those lessons that i've learned from team sports and being part of higher performance teams and apply them to not only banking but certainly Bluestone and I'm, I'm still learning you know I've, I've moved from say being uh, more a, a captain's role in, mm -hmm. in footy and banking to now being a coach like my role is yeah. to coach the team I can't go out there and work in 50 stores I have to help architect and put people in the right spots and motivate them and inspire them and making sure that we're on the right path we've got the right strategy and we have the right capital and you know, that's that's my role now which is it's, it's certainly a big change and but it's it's been wonderful you know? is it completely different running one cafe versus running many in regards to just how it the, the whole operation yeah, works it's just so incredibly different and not only are we now running 50, but we're in eight markets with eight legal structures and eight different cultures. It's, 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 the complexity increases exponentially uh -huh. when you go to how different Toronto is from Philadelphia or how mm -hmm. different LA is to San Fran or how different San Fran is to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's, there's a lot of complexity, but that was the challenge. That was the risk reward for us. Like if we can execute and pull it off, we would actually have a national brand. Yeah. If we stayed small and focused in New York, we'd probably be far more profitable. How do you mm. create trust? Like, I guess you, you're going to have a bunch of lawyers in different markets. How do you pick those critical parts of the business? 
I think with, with trust, the, the way I establish trust with people is through dependability. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm looking for, for people who are extremely dependable and reliable, who give consistency of, of effort and that they are at work on time and they care and they're committed and passionate. Like I'm not looking for the best barista. Yeah. I'm looking for mm. someone who again can like play their role and playing a role as part of a barista is yeah you've got to make great coffee but you've got to provide outstanding service mm-hmm. you've got to have that theatrical element that I think people love about Australian cafes mm. what about the senior stuff like in the books like the structure level how do you like that high up level how do you uh, gauge that because I guess there's a lot like one thing with the US is it feels like people know how to hype they know how to talk and I feel like I would get uh a bit paranoid that is this person just really good at talking can they execute I, I think that sometimes uh, people in this market sort of over promise and under deliver uh-huh. uh, versus maybe my standards mm-hmm. um, you know we, we're trying to grow faster than most and do it at a premium uh, value proposition and we're mm-hmm. trying to do it in complex markets and you know, you know, to be able to execute effectively, you've got to have very, very high standards, unrelenting standards. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people's expectations on what's premium is different from yours yeah. and that's your over-promise, under-deliver. But um, I think, you know, you never, you never entirely know. You've just mm-hmm. got to uh, ask the right questions and observe and make sure that you have enough critical people in your team that can make calls and provide the right feedback and coach them and if they're either going to get it or they're not and mm-hmm. you got to assume getting in good intent and get everyone an opportunity yeah when it's not working you just got to be honest so it's, it's not going to work and yeah. uh, i think you're a great person happy to go for a beer with you happy to have a coffee but maybe you're not perfect fit for bluestone lane and gonna try and do it with as much dignity as possible but that's like life it's you mm-hmm. know like you may have lots of people that want to work on sit in this seat and yeah. get on a podcast but you know they're not perfect fit for it yeah. that's okay like I think you know in hospitality culture is far more important than any technical component mm-hmm. in other industries technical skills are more important than, than mm. maybe your cultural fit but hospitality is about making other people feel happy and satisfied and excited and you got to change the way way they feel so if you're if you're not dedicated to to that pursuit I don't know if, if it, the industry's cut out for you and probably not Bluestone Lane's cut out for you. How, as a business owner, do you set up a, a solid framework to create a great culture? Well, you've got to lead by example, right? I think, I think you, you know, the fish rots is at the head, as they say, and I think you need to be very clear on your expectations. You need to be very clear on your value proposition and why you, why Bluestone Lane should exist and why, uh, why we customers are going to like us and want to come back. And then just be very, very clear on your standards out of the gate. Like, yeah. And just know who you are. And be so crystal clear on what makes you special and, and mm. why you think there's an opportunity for you to grow a business. And is this something you you had before you launched? You opened yeah. your first one? Okay. I spent an incredible amount of work on analyzing how we could compete and how we could grow and what the brand should stand for and the way it should feel and the experience should 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 be like. and. The cost structure like I, I came from a, I was very fortunate I had a background of being like analytical right <laughs> yeah. that was my that was my uh, skill set that was my business as usual and then I could overlay it with a real deep interest in how to build brands and rather than a collection of stores how do I build an actual brand that stands uh-huh. for something and in our case we wanted to be this extension of an Australian lifestyle yeah we wanted to encourage people to go out and get a coffee and socialize mm. not just get a coffee to go to drink at your guests we wanted you to come down with a colleague and chat and and get that broader sort of daily escape and uh, I think that a lesson I, I you know I always convey to entrepreneurs is don't jump into this unless you can answer all the questions mm. and you don't have to have like just general questions like you know can you make a profit can you generate revenue can you make a profit can you employ people are they actually going to go to work can you generate loyalty with your customers yeah and i think i got a lot of i got a lot of confidence from people challenging me and saying oh you know 
it's too expensive. Oh, no, it's too slow. Oh, no, it doesn't have um, syrups. And, mm. and it's too blue. Just, uh, too blue. <laughs> and just like, take it off the boxes. Yeah, yeah but there's yeah. a person who doesn't want syrup mm. because there's, there's a health conscious niche and this niche is this age and that's our mm. core customer. And yeah. if I put the stores where the core customer wants to hang out or work or live, maybe I can compete there. Okay, good point. Okay, tick that one. And then just working methodically mm. down the list and then I've suddenly felt like, hey, there's enough there's enough sort of signals that we could make yeah. it to it, overcome the, the barriers. Is it the opposite approach to test and learn minimum viable product? Well, I think like test and learn and rapid prototyping are really like concepts linked to technology, right? Mm. Like mm. where you you are assessing things so dynamically. Yeah. I can't... Harder to do with a lease. Yeah, I can. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. I can't open a store and go, ah, four days in, yeah. poor sales, yeah. done. You know, my <laughs> yeah. lead time's so much bigger. My CapEx is so much bigger. Um, yeah. So the culture, the brand, I think Tommy and I are very comfortable with that sort of stuff. The, the thing that I find fascinating is the cost structures and the idea that if you're in all these different markets, paying... Uh, a few cents more on almond milk at the supplier level level could be the difference between making money and not making money. Like how how do you make sure that those things are all dialed in so then you don't have to worry at that sort of sell level of a spreadsheet? So supply chain is is absolutely critical and we have a really, really good one. In mm. fact mm. the a partner in banking I uh, brought in to oversee supply chain. He never worked in supply chain in his life, but he just had a fantastic mindset on business and he and he was a he studied law and then he was in banking and he just sort of very practical and pragmatic and like most of these things are. Mm-hmm. Like you don't need to be a professor of supply chain. Like you gotta work out how to get point A to point B yeah. the most efficiently the most reliably the, in the, and with the best quality product you can get for the price like so but supply chain in our case has big risks in some commodities like particularly mm-hmm. coffee prices paper prices and what we experienced this year was avocado prices avocado mm-hmm. prices went up 500% in July and August and it really crushed our uh, gross profit line mm. and we are now looking to uh, purchase like have a forward sort of purchasing obligation where we have the price locked in if we buy a certain amount of volume but that takes time to be able to get to that scale and we're sort of there now but it's it is you know it's not only just what I'm buying the avocado price is getting the portion control right it's mm-hmm. getting your wastage right it's um, mm. making sure that you know we're, that we're not just giving product away and that the staff aren't having a free for all like yeah. it is it's a it is a business ultimately that needs to be sustainable and the business is what generates the cash to be able to pay everyone's wages and to be able to grow and to invest more into the stores or in, more into our training and mm. and opportunities to grow so uh, you know we we it's it's an area that we're spending an an, an inorbitant amount of time right mm. now on getting the gross profit right and also getting the the labor productivity mm. right and uh, yeah you know it's so minimum wage in New York City went up twenty percent this year mm. right well, can you imagine like yeah. costs like you, everyone that yeah. works for you got a twenty percent raise in one year and it was mandatory mm. it was mandatory by by the uh, the state government and. That's pretty hard to yeah. swallow. I couldn't mm. put up all my I couldn't put up my avocado toast price twenty percent. I yeah. had to absorb it and somehow offset it through increased sales volume, not really spend. Um, Did you see a shift in culture? I mean, teams that are going okay. Now we're earning twenty percent more. This is they could actually live. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Could well, it's it's a pro and a con. Like I think for certain pockets, it's a, it was a very beneficial and mm-hmm. much needed. There is definitely a big disparity here between um, those who are entitled to tips and gratuities and those who aren't. It's an archaic system, 100% don't agree with it. Mm-hmm. But effectively, those who don't directly serve a customer aren't entitled to a tip. Mm-hmm. So you, know, you got a coffee here and let's just say you give a dollar tip, yeah. which is nothing in the US when you mm-hmm. consider um, you go to a bar and you're guaranteed to give one or two dollars even mm-hmm. though pouring a beer is a lot easier making that yeah. oat milk piccolo coffee yeah. Yeah. it's a big it's another broader issue that's a bit strange here but you give a dollar tip like none of that dollar is entitled to go to the back of house if we're getting a coffee to go I've been selecting 18% yeah. 
So I'm giving that's, something. That's, that's generous and uh -huh. fair. And like, well, we're not here really, for that long, but I but wonder if I was really, living. Really, really appreciate it, yeah. yeah. Like, is that, like, from a standard, like, what do you feel like the uh, the citizens of the US, what are they doing as a standard when it comes to tipping for things it's, like to go? So co coffee to go, honestly, mm -hmm. it's 5% here, uh -huh. which is quite perplexing because if you go to a bar and buy a beer, yeah. which literally takes no skill whatsoever mm. like everyone can pour a beer right yeah. and the beer is six bucks you're going to give the bartender a, a dollar you're mm -hmm. going to pay with a 10 and he's going to give you back four ones mm -hmm. and you're going to leave a one for yeah. you so a dollar on six you know it's what are that nearly 20 yeah. percent so you need to start putting vodka in your coffee basically yeah you know that. that's an option it's start <laughs> like just out of the gate espresso <laughs> martinis <right? laughs> no, no flat whites anymore just like espresso martinis um there's, there's, uh, it's a cultural thing, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think we're trying to, we're, we're trying to educate people mm -hmm. around that these people are highly trained and mm. people are so, so passionate about their coffee. Like one yeah. bad coffee, you're yeah. upset for the morning. Yeah. Yeah, one yeah. bad beer, like the yeah. beer's flat. You're like, oh, yeah, it's yeah. Beer, or the beer's not perfectly cold. Do you you're know like, what? Oh, it's you know, not that cold. But you don't sort of like think, oh, never going to buy a beer from that place again. You're probably like, oh, let's hope the next yeah, one's because cold. Because the alcohol yeah. kicks in. You're yeah. just feeling <laughs> bit, bit less tipsy. anxious. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, do you find that, uh, I don't know, like from a market rate point of view, do you find that because you guys are doing that sort of bespoke art, artisan or whatever the fuck they, they say? Like that art, artisan. Artisan, thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> There's just a couple of gronks trying to work out what they want. Uh, do you find that you end up, uh, do they make more tips here because people, customers who come here see it as, as more than just... Well, they make a lot more tips in our cafes because yeah. food and the hospitality elements are a lot more experiential. Mm -hmm. So your table service here, someone's working with you and looking after you mm -hmm. and, and educating you and, and helping you. So um, certainly the tip the tip percentage is a lot higher, mm -hmm. multiples higher than just to go. But that's 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 legacy. Mm -hmm. That's not us. That's what that's the US system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, eventually there'll be a, there'll be a change, I think. But but we're in a we're in a tough, I would say, transition right now. Where minimum wage has gone up so much, but tips are still the same. So if anything, it's almost like accelerating. The, uh, to some case, maybe be accelerating the, the divergence in wage between back of house and front of house, which definitely wasn't the intention with increasing minimum wage in I certain think, cities and I states. Think, I think there's a lot of Aussies that come over here and they might think things are backwards or just totally different to back home. I saw you folding up a check before. I didn't see how much it was for, <laughs> but I saw you folding up a check and I was like, you guys still use checks. And then I remember driving from the airport, there's a, you know, cash your checks here. Is there thing, a few things in business in America that you just think we got to get rid of that, or you just sort of grit your teeth and go, we got no choice? It's amazing. I'm happy to admit this, but I was I was a banker for 11 years, and like when I moved to the states, or prior to moving to the states, I say seven, six years, I didn't know how to write a check. I had to Google. Like, <laughs> pay to and you know do I do I put lines on it and write yeah, things yeah, yeah. and you know non-negotiable or void or whatever and there's some things like that that just don't make sense so yeah. you've got the biggest tech companies in the world all based here and you've got you know incredible fintech investment but like people are getting paid via check and like mm -hmm. we I think we have 650 650 staff right I would say of the 650 200 still getting checks weekly is, uh, is that their choice crazy. or yeah yeah. It's their choice. We want to pay everyone a direct debit. We don't want to cut <laughs> checks and sign them. We, a, a member of our team does check signing oh, <laughs> for like three hours on, on a Thursday. And uh, like, and that person does not want to do it. <laughs> but there's no option, you know? Like, that That's stuff's crazy. just crazy. Yeah, yeah. But, um, why, would an, why. why would a staff member want to want check? I, I've, I've I guess if you've really always sure. done it that way yeah, yeah I, I guess, guess it's like, like rich ritual routine uh -huh. you know <laughs> people who still pay their power bill at the post office There's something that nostalgic of, that about kind of it vibe. Uh, bef before you go uh, if someone's thinking about starting a business in the US what's one question that they should ask themselves one question is yeah. is tough uh -huh. ultimately I think if you want to make it in the US, you've got to go all in. Mm -hmm. 
I see a lot of people think about opening in the US. I don't think the notion of thinking does not <laughs> make it here. Yeah. It's it's the city it's a country in which people all around the world want to come and make it in and certainly like a city like New York City it's the world city mm -hmm. so you're not just competing against New Yorkers you're competing against people from other parts of America you're competing against people from South America from Europe so I, I think that you need to be all in mm -hmm. and to be all in you got to take a tremendous amount of personal risk so that would be my one piece of advice mm -hmm. like be prepared you you are moving mm -hmm. You're going to be on the hook for a lease. You're going to take a you're going to have to rent a place. You're not going to consider about flying in from Australia and flying in the states. They see through that. You're all in and uh, mm. you need to pay the price and you mm -hmm. need to 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 put yourself on the line and if you do, honestly, Americans are really really open-minded and they're very proactive and entrepreneurial and I do think they see the um, that they look through things with with good intent and optimism and that resonates really really well with Australians who've got that attitude of giving it a go and are not too fussy and happy to be scrappy and lean in and do whatever it takes and be social and be open-minded if you've got those qualities and they know you're here and you're going to give it everything you got people will give you a chance and that is what's incredibly exciting and inspiring about being here yeah i think you feel it like yeah. us just being in the store there is that and seeing all the, ex the experiences of the u.s it's not until you sit down at a bluestone lane having a coffee Oops. that you appreciate the amount of logistics and also just uh just ability to to cut through all of the things mm. that you need to do to make it happen it's very like we find it extremely inspiring uh, so we're going to see the, the the Daily, the Daily Talk, Talk Show. show. Uh, well, we keep talking. So this is the funny thing. When you're in Melbourne, it's like, yeah, we fuck, if we we're in LA and then you yeah. come here, it's like, we're just some big babies. We've got a few yeah. years. Well, you realise the, the scale that it's being played at. And, and I think there's such... The bubbles in Australia consist of quite a few people that make mm. up quite a lot of the majority. We come over here and you realise how small our bubble is yeah. or how the, there's just little bubbles here that there's so much more to it yeah, in there's, LA. There's a, there seems like there's a bit of a bullshit filter too. Yeah. So like if uh, if we were to, to do it, if you don't have those things lined up, as you said, if you're sort of half putting a toe in, yeah. you're destined. So I think... Um, I, yeah. I think they see through it. They're used yeah. to it. They're, they're used to, oh yeah, well, I had a friend like this from France three years ago. <laughs> yeah. 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 He lasted one winter. Yeah. It's gone. You know, the exciting part about the US is and this is the technology has certainly facilitated this but mm -hmm. you don't need to now land in LA or New York you mm -hmm. could honestly land in Austin Texas mm -hmm. you could land mm -hmm. in in Nashville Tennessee you could land in Miami Florida and these tier two cities are absolutely exploding because people now have more flexibility with where they want to work and where how they can work so that's super exciting because the cost structure in those cities is a lot lower you mm -hmm. know the barrier of entry is lower and mm. so that's I think Australians think, yeah, got to make it in Big Apple. Well, maybe now it's maybe Big Apple's bit, bit, uh, the, the second step. Maybe yeah. let's land in, let's land uh, in San Diego. Mm -hmm. Let's land in Seattle, and then see if we can make it there. Those cities are still big, mm. got a million people, and there's lots of opportunities to broadcast your proposition and your and your message. And then let's attack New York next. Uh, so that's a little bit of salient advice and that's yeah. definitely a new theme the mm. emergence of these tier twos and without a doubt it's been underpinned by technology mm. yeah. because people now can for example live in Austin, Texas pay no city tax no state tax and pay less to rent mm. it gives you a lot more a lot more runway to get something off the ground versus California where you're paying state and city tax mm. of 14, 13, 14 percent. Are you paying for hard. the dream? Is there overinflation? Like, are there all these things? Like, is it overinflated? Is it uh, like I guess just oversaturated in the sense of New York? Like, actors, for instance. If you want to act, you go to uh, Los Angeles, and we see the amount of Uber drivers that mm. have actors. Gorgeous looking. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, have, yeah, and yeah. can speak in seven different accents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, and so I guess that, that that's part of the whole thing too is going to those other cities. Is it's like it's probably not as crazy inflated. It, yeah, without a doubt, mm -hmm. and it obviously depends on the industry you're mm -hmm. trying to crack it. You know, if you're trying to make it in 
in acting, uh-huh. yeah, there's, you're going to play Hollywood and you're going to play maybe New York on the uh-huh. theatre circuit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But a lot of other industries aren't linked to a particular city. There's mm-hmm. there's pockets of engineering in 30 cities. There's pockets of technology in 10 big cities here. Um, hospitality, you know, there's probably 50 cities that you could mm-hmm. do something pretty special. And Come- Coming to Los Angeles, I, I realised the ease that I have it back home in terms of ease of life, having a kid, the roads that I drive on, they're not as busy as I thought they were. It feels like yeah. traffic, but when you come here, it is pretty crazy. What is one thing you actually love about living in California? So uh, I've only lived in LA for uh, just under two years and we live in Santa Monica. And um, So I think Santa Monica and, the, and everyone talks about the 405, like defi- yeah. dividing the city and it yeah. is actually very true. Like <laughs> the fact that I made it out here. Well, I, this is the second time I've attempted it, right? <laughs> it's a real journey. Yeah, you persisted with me. The first time was a misfire. It was going to take too long to get here. What and, I've know. learned is it's usually about 25 minutes one way and then you double it to get back. Yeah, so it took me... And what happens, what is crazy is you look on your phone and the Uber says, all right, 22 minutes. Okay, mm-hmm. great. Get in the Uber. 22 minutes. I'm on time. Mid Uber ride, it goes from 22 <laughs> to 27 to 32 to 37. You're like, what is going on? I'm going closer. And then like the time's going up. And literally that's because it's so dependent on roads. You have one accident, blocks yeah. a lane. Yeah. Like there's 20 minutes on your journey. And I remember at, when I moved here, I was like going to apologizing and calling to people and I'm, I'm often not the most like prompt I must yeah. admit I'm always put too many things on my calendar but people are like no nah, that happens the whole time <laughs> like I only get to half our meetings half the meetings I take in the car trying to get to the meeting because of an accident or something mm. goes wrong we're in New York like the subway so damn efficient pretty yeah. grimy and dirty but yeah. incredibly <laughs> efficient yeah. uh, but you know Santa Monica is close to the beach and um, the weather is absolutely extraordinary like mm. consistency of weather it might you know it's probably improving because of um, global warming which is not yeah. a good thing but you know it's just like you know, it's pretty epic but um, you know I think it's more like an Australian mm-hmm. style lifestyle close to the beach mm. you can we can walk to the shops we don't have to drive um, the climate is very moderate uh, particularly in winter and being close to the beach you don't get the the crazy heat that you get in the valley you get mm-hmm. the sea breeze that cools things down so it's worked out well but we're actually moving back to the east coast so this is going to be two years in here and we go back to the east coast because i've been traveling so much and yeah. doing one week in la and one week in new york and it's just it's just too just just too just too hard when you go to melbourne what cafe do you go to uh well, there's a lot. You know, I, I think like the top the top cafes are um, obviously <laughs> nearly got my burrito. <laughs> um, <laughs> nearly lost a burrito. I, yeah, guys. I, I, um, you know, I think I, I love the kettle black top paddock. Yeah. But I love things like Pillar of Salt. I mm-hmm. love Journeyman. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I love Steve Rowley's cafes are amazing. Um, plain sailing in Elwood. That's mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can I have half? Uh, all right, you can have half. You can have half. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, I lost half my burrito. But I'll go. Um, you know, I think it's there's so many. You know, every every time I go there. But you know, I used to go to Patricia mm-hmm. in the city. Um, absolutely love that. And I, you know, I used to. I, and when I go home, we often stay at my parents-in-law place, and they're around the corner from a cafe called uh, Little Locks, and close to plain sailing. That's but, great. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the consistency of cafes is so high in Melbourne. I think it's more the social ritual I love, the mm. fact of just going, um, going to catch up with going with my wife and reading the papers back to front, having two coffees, avocado toast with with the, with halloumi and. Uh, mushrooms, roasted tomato, like it's just magical. Yeah. It's such a great way to disconnect and just relax mm. a little bit. And then during the week, you know, Monday through Friday, I'd go twice a day. Uh, morning catch up as a team, and then uh, yeah, all good. And then um, you know, the afternoon was was before we you know we were working so late that yeah. we used to get another coffee at three o'clock because we made get out of the office at six, seven, eight, ten. 12 p.m. You know, you never know really, and sometimes in that type of banking. Yeah, well, I think you've brought the, the dream uh, to the U.S. It's super exciting. Thanks so much 
for your time, Nick, because I know this is it's outrageous yeah. that you're able to sit with us for this long. <laughs> We've made you miss about two meetings and, and you've got a bur- half a burrito. burrito. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <It's> got <laughs> it's a daily talk show. If you've enjoyed the show, feel free to Instagram us, uh, share share your stories. Hi, the daily talk show.com is the email address. And if you're in LA, come to Bluestone Cafe, yeah. Bluestone Lane. Absolutely. Or in New York or, New York, or DC oh, yeah, or yeah, Toronto. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. Which is your favourite one, very quickly? There's a there's a cafe we have on the Upper East Side. There's uh-huh. in a church opposite Central Park. That's pretty magical. Amazing. Uh, yeah, like that one a lot. What yeah, awesome. number was that out of the? I think it was like number six. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first cafe was in West Village, and that was where where we lived. And that's that. It's one to hold uh-huh. close to our heart. Yeah. I think that's the one I spent yeah. a bit of time yeah. at. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Nick. It's a daily talk show. See you tomorrow, guys. See you guys.